Well, hello, Madison Church. My name is Jason. I'm on staff here, and I just want to wish you a very happy Thanksgiving. Hope you had a great time uh, celebrating, eating turkey, eating gravy and stuffing and mashed potatoes. You're probably still in a sleep-induced coma from all that, but I'm glad you were here. I don't know about you, but it seems like every year around this time, something snaps inside of me. The chaos of the holidays, the pressure to get everything done, the financial pressure of buying my kids every present that they want, they can just feel like it's too much. On top of that, you're spending extra time with people who are equally stressed out, people that you are sometimes forced to spend time with because you're related to them. Now, I need you to be honest here for a moment. Just answer this in your living rooms. How many of you have a time limit for how long you can spend with certain people in your life over the holidays? In other words, you know you can spend one day or maybe two days max with them, but if it comes to day three, all hell breaks loose and you just snap. How many of you are sitting next to that person in your living room right now? Lest you think you're alone in this reality, let me give you a moment of confession here. Several years ago, I was at my parents' house at Christmas time, and something happens when you walk into your family of origin's home, even when you're older. There's like a time warp machine that happens as you walk through the door, and all of a sudden, you become your 13-year-old self again, and that's what happened with me. Now, we love to play games at my house, especially at Christmas. It's one of our traditions that we play board games, and so that Christmas, we decided to play not just Scrabble, but Speed Scrabble. Now, I don't know if you've ever played Speed Scrabble. Let me just describe it. It is a game from Satan himself. There's no redeeming value whatsoever of Speed Scrabble. So here's how it works. You all get a certain number of tiles, and you have to make as many words connect as possible within two minutes. And it gets really, really intense. Now, before I continue, I must say this to my family because I know they're watching. Mom and Dad, I love you. You're awesome. You're great parents. David, my brother, you're all right. I don't mind you. You're, you're a pretty good dude. But there's one problem when it comes to my family, now that that disclaimer is over. There's one problem is that we're ultra competitive. And so there we were playing speed scrabble. It was getting more and more intense. Our Christmas spirit had turned into the spirit of Satan. My dad, who was a stickler for rules, kept challenging any word and, and any move we made. My brother was just being annoying, which is what he does. My mom wasn't saying anything. She was just staring at us because she couldn't believe how we were acting. And my grandmother, my grandmother, who's the most godly woman I had ever met in my life, my grandmother, who throughout her life, of 101 years, prayed for me two hours every day. My grandmother, who led huge ministries throughout her life, mentored hundreds, if not more, women towards the way of Jesus. My grandmother, who was probably a saint, my grandmother, who was the closest person to Jesus I have ever known, my grandmother was cheating. Not not just like, oops, I didn't mean to type of cheating. No, diabolical cutthroat. I'm going to do whatever it takes to beat you cheating. So this started to get to me. My blood started to boil and boil and boil. Then after one round, my dad challenged one of my words. My brother said something stupid. And my grandmother added 50 points to her score. And I was done. I snapped. I broke. And so I picked up my Scrabble letters. I threw them across the table and I yelled at all of them. I hate playing games with you. And I ran to my old bedroom, slammed the door, jumped on the bed, started pounding my fist against the bed and cried. I was 25 years old. Let me ask you, where in your life do you feel like you're breaking? Where have things just snapped? I'm not asking if you have issues playing Scrabble like me, but what feels broken, shattered into pieces, and you're wondering if it'll ever be put back together again. Maybe for you, before March, life was great. You're advancing in your career. You had financial security, and things felt all good and safe. And then COVID hit, and with it, your industry was hit. And even though you were a top performer at your workplace, your boss came in and she told you, I'm sorry, we have to let you go because of cutbacks. And in that moment, everything you were so sure of broke into pieces. Maybe you're a person of color. You thought things were progressing in systemic change in our world. And then you saw story after story of people being shot and killed unjustly by officers 
Brianna Taylor, Jacob Blake, and the list goes on and on. What you thought was progress came to a screeching halt. You saw a rising divide in this country. You read posts from people who claim to be Christians, some of whom are your friends that can only be described as blatantly racist. And your confidence that things could be different for you, for your kids, for your grandkids, well, it broke into pieces. Maybe for you, it wasn't something on a national scale like a pandemic or systemic racism, but it was just as devastating. Maybe it was a doctor who came in and told you, I'm sorry, but it's cancer. Maybe it was a spouse who said, I'm done. Maybe it's a son who won't return your calls or a friend who is no longer your friend or a boss who continues to single you out and pick on you. Or maybe it's just a dream that has died. Whatever it is, it broke. Or maybe it's just something inside. Doubts that have crept in. Insecurities that have taken over. You've lost your sense of hope. And the holiday season only makes it that much worse. Whatever it is, big or small, we all have something in our lives that once felt like it was put together and now all of a sudden is broken into pieces. And we wonder, can it ever be put back together again? Well, today we're launching a new series called BC, which stands for not just before Christ, but before Christmas. And the big idea in this series is that the Old Testament tells the story of God before Christmas, before Jesus, and pointing to Jesus. You see, the Israelites, God's people, felt like life had broken into pieces. They they had once been the world power. They had once been known as God's chosen people. They had once had everything going for them, but now everything was shattered. Israel split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom had already been overtaken by the Assyrians, and the southern kingdom, Judah, was about to fall to the Babylonians. And into this, into this dynamic, God sends these people called prophets. Now, prophets are simply messengers from God with a message to God's people. They're messengers from God who come and bring a message from God to God's people. In 700 B.C., The world is full of violence and injustice, and God's people feel hopeless. War is raging. People aren't following God. Everything seems broken. And God sends this prophet named Micah. And listen to what he says in chapter 5 of Micah. He says, Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. Now listen to this. But you, Bethlehem, Epathra, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one, he's referring to Jesus, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The world's at war. Everything's broken. In the midst of this chaos, Micah comes and he puts up billboards for people saying, hey, in a little bit, You're going to see Jesus coming. It's as if you're traveling along the road and you just see billboard after billboard just saying, hang on, you're almost there. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're kind of in the middle of nowhere, but you see billboards promising something ahead. A few years ago, I went with my kids camping in South Dakota in the Badlands and the Black Hills and around Mount Rushmore, beautiful, beautiful area. But if you've ever traveled, especially from Wisconsin to South Dakota, you know that once you reach South Dakota, there is absolutely nothing, like nothing at all. There's not even a Starbucks. There's not a McDonald's. You just have vast nothingness that you're driving through, and you're wondering if anybody actually lives in the state. There is Laura Ingle Wilde's house, you know, from Little House on the Prairie, but nothing has been developed since then. And so you're just driving and driving and driving in this vast emptiness, in this vast chaos. But along the road, every few miles, there's these billboards for this place called Waldrug. I don't know if you've ever been to Waldrug. It's actually like a, a place of everything under the sun, but 
It starts from like 300 miles out. It says wall drug 300 miles away, and then wall drug 150 miles away. Every few miles, there's a wall drug free ice water, wall drug five cent coffee available for you. And I've had the coffee, it's not even worth five cents, but wall drug, wall drug, wall drug, billboard after billboard saying, hang on, your journey. I know it seems like there's nothing here, but I'm just telling you, there is a destination coming. There is something out there for you. In the same way, that's what Mike is saying. That's what prophets do. They're saying, they're putting up billboards saying, I know things are rough. I know you can't see the way forward, but Jesus is coming. He's coming. And every few miles, he's coming. Don't worry. And so verse 3, he continues, Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. And the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites He, that's Jesus, here's another billboard. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And don't miss this. This is the key to everything. And he, Jesus, and he will be our peace. He will be our peace. You know, I wonder what it was like for the people to hear that. The people and their vast nothingness that they were riding around in, the war that was going on, the brokenness that was pervading their life, for Micah to come in and say there's still hope, that there could be this elusive thing called peace, that there would be one who would come who would bring this peace. Now, it's important to understand what Micah means when he says peace. You know, oftentimes when we hear the word peace, we just assume it's an absence of conflict. And and there's some truth to that. But the Jewish understanding, the Hebrew understanding of the word peace is this word shalom. And shalom is the presence of God in all of you. It's far beyond just an absence of conflict. It literally means you will be whole again. You won't be broken anymore. And so Micah is saying, there is one who is coming who will take all of the broken pieces of your life and put them back together. You will be whole again. You will be whole emotionally, spiritually, relationally. He will piece you back together. He will give you shalom. And what Micah prophesied so long ago is what is available to each of us today. That no matter how broken your life may feel right now, there is one who can bring you shalom. There is one who can piece those broken parts of your life back together. There's one who can make you whole again, who can and will bring you peace. You see, because there's not billboards anymore, that person arrived. Just like Micah said, he was born in a town called Bethlehem, an unincorporated town, a tiny little town in the middle of nowhere. And he was different than anybody else the world had ever seen. And his name is Jesus. And he offers each of us this shalom, this peace, when everything seems broken. And don't miss this. Here's the reality. When life feels like it is in pieces, when your life is broken in pieces, Jesus' peace will piece it back together. When your life is in pieces, Jesus' peace will piece it back together. And he offers that to you. So the question is, will you receive it? Many of you know that from previous messages I've given that I'm in recovery from addiction. And one of the things that I pray every single day, in fact, I write in my journal, and one of the things I pray when I'm at a group, a 12-step group, we actually end every meeting this way, is a prayer that has changed the lives of literally millions upon millions of people. It's called the serenity prayer. And it goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, the easy part of that prayer for me is the courage to change the things I can. I I like to have courage. I like to be an, an agent of change. The hard part of that prayer is that first part. God, grant me the serenity. God, grant me literally the peace. God, grant me the shalom to accept the things I cannot change. You see, the reality is, 
is that there are things in our lives that we can't change. Some of them are based on consequences of things we've done, but oftentimes they're not even of our doing. We didn't create a pandemic. We didn't cause the cancer. We didn't cause financial uncertainty. We didn't cause our son to make the decision he did. We didn't cause our boss to be the way that she is. Those things just happen. There is brokenness in this world. Frederick Buechner, who I love, would write this. He, he would say, here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things are going to happen. Don't be afraid. Here is the world. Beautiful. Oh, great. Thanks, God. And terrible things are going to happen. Don't be afraid. And we're okay with the beautiful things. It's the terrible things that we don't know what to do with. The broken things. But Beekner is saying it's just part of life. And you can't change them. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. But the problem is we think we can change them. And so we try. We try to figure out a way to change the way that person you're dating feels about you or you want to date feels about you. But you can't change a human heart. You try to figure out a way to make this pandemic end. Let me ask you, how's that working for you? You try to figure out a way to make whatever it is in your life you want to change, change, but you can't. And when we realize we can't, we break. We just break right in two, and we break in a variety of ways. First of all, we, we take it out on others. And, and usually it's the people closest to us. In fact, James would say this. He said, well, why do you have conflicts? Why do you have quarrels within? It's because there's desires raging within you. You have, but you, you, you want, but you don't have, so you kill. In other words, James is saying there's broken things inside of you, and what happens when you're broken inside, you take it out on people closest to you. H- have you ever wondered why it is you hurt the people you say you love the most? It's not because you're trying to hurt them. It's just they're in close proximity to you. And so when things are broken inside of you, you break the person closest to you. See, broken people break people. And so you spend yet another day doing virtual school with your kids and you're going crazy. I mean, if you have to do one more math problem with your seven-year-old who doesn't even want to be online, you are going to snap. You make it through the day, but you are broken inside. You're wiped out and you talk to your husband and he just says something innocent and you unload on him. You break him. Because broken people break people. Let me ask you, in your brokenness, are you breaking others? Because oftentimes we do. We take it out on others, but sometimes we take it out on God. We assume that this is God's fault. If he really cared about me, then he wouldn't have these circumstances going on in my life. He would make them all go away. I remember a friend of mine not too long ago, he lost his job and it was kind of unfair. It was a company policy that if he got in a car, car accident with a company car, that he would immediately be fired. And the accident wasn't even his fault, but he got in an accident, lost his job. I remember having coffee with him and asked him how he was doing with the job loss. And he said, yeah, it's been really hard. But what's been even harder, Jason, is my wife of one year just left me as well. And after listening more to that story, I said, so how are you doing with God? And I'll never forget what he said. He says, I'm done with God. I'm done with the church. If this is how God is going to treat me, I want nothing to do with him. His brokenness was causing him to take it out on God. See, sometimes we take it out on others. Sometimes we take it out on God. But probably the most dangerous thing is we take it out on ourselves. This is where it gets really, really dangerous. See, broken people do break people, but the person they break the most is themselves. When they can't change the circumstances in their lives, they just assume there must be something wrong with me. I must be the issue. And soon your self-image goes out the door. Soon you spiral into apathy. You come to church or go online each week. You sing the songs. You go through the motions. You play the spiritual game, but you don't feel any of it. You're done. And soon that apathy spirals into depression. And soon that depression spirals even into worse things. You take it out on yourself. But here's the good news. It doesn't have to actually be this way. There is a different way. You can let Jesus' peace protect you. This is what Jesus promised. Remember, the peacemaker that 
Micah spoke of, he came into this world and in John 16, 33, he says this, I have told you these things so that in me, here it is, you may have peace. You may have shalom. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In other words, he's saying, there's going to be trouble. I know there are going to be things, things going on around you that you can't control. And I know you're going to want to change them, but I'm just telling you, you can't. You're not going to be able to change them. And they will seek to break you right in two, but they don't have to. And here's how they don't. These two key words in that verse, in me. He says, be in me. Because when you are in me, you can have peace. Why? Because I have beaten all those circumstances. I, he says, have overcome the world. So I can overcome any situation, any pandemic, any job loss, any situation, any relational difficulty that comes at you. But the only way that works is if you put yourself in me and let me protect you. And maybe we could picture it this way. This is you, you're a Royal Dalton figurehead, but... Pretend this is you and, and this is the things coming at you in life. And I'm not going to smash it because this is actually kind of valuable. But, but you think you can beat these things in life. You think you can beat the circumstances coming on. But Jesus is saying, no, you can't. You're fragile. You're human. These things, if they keep coming at you and you try to change them yourself, are just going to smash you in two. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to let me protect you. So be in me. Because when you are in me, you no longer see the circumstances. You are now protected. And so they can come at you and they can keep hitting you. And you might be rattled and you might move around a little bit. You may fall on your feet, but I am going to protect you. That pandemic may keep coming. That job loss may get worse. That financial situation may go downhill. And the hammer might keep coming and coming and coming. But you know what? It's not going to destroy you because I am protecting you. You are in me. I've got this. No matter how hard that hammer comes at you, no matter how many circumstances try to smash you in two, I've already overcome it. It can keep hitting and hitting you and hitting you, but it's not going to destroy you because it sees me and not you. And I have overcome the world. That's why Paul would write this. Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything. In other words, Paul's saying that there's going to be hammers that are going to come and try to break you. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard... It will protect your hearts and your minds. Now remember this again. In Christ Jesus. And so what this means is that when life seems to be breaking all around you, instead of trying to fight it on your own and trying to control it on your own, just surrender to the one who already has beaten it. Ask him to protect you from the things that will attack your heart and your mind. Say, God, I can't do this. It's too hard. Keep my mind, guard my mind from the lies that says that this is all it will ever be. Or God, my heart is breaking. I'm so tired of rejection. Guard, God, guard my heart because it's too much right now. Or God, I'm starting to believe the lies that the reason these things are happening to me is because I am broken, because I'm a mess, because I deserve this to happen to me, that there's something wrong with me. I know that's a lie, but it's coming at me. God, guard my mind. Guard my heart. It's as simple and as hard as that. Just saying, God, protect me. Give me your peace. Give me shalom. And he will. Now, he may not change your circumstances. In fact, the hammer may come stronger and stronger at you. But even if it comes stronger at you, you will be stronger because you will be protected. Because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, will surround you and piece you back together. You know, I hope I really do that this pandemic comes to an end and you can get back to some semblance of the life you once knew. But even if it doesn't, even if the hammer hits harder and harder and we have to have 
stronger and stronger restrictions of what we can and can't do. You can be okay. You can have shalom. And I hope, I really do, that the relationship in your life that is broken is restored, is put back together again. But even if that relationship remains in pieces, you don't have to be in pieces. You can have shalom. You can be whole, regardless of how the other person responds to you. And I hope, I really do, that your financial situation or job situation goes up and to the right, that things get better and stronger than ever before. But even if they don't, even if the hammer hits and keeps hitting, you can have shalom knowing that Jesus, the one who is the Prince of Peace, will always provide for you. You won't be broken by this. And so let me ask you, where in your life do you feel like you're broken to pieces? You don't have to stay there. You can actually have peace this holiday season. You can have shalom. You know, one of the most inspirational stories I've ever read is that of Horatio Spafford. Horatio was a wildly successful businessman in the 1870s in Chicago. He owned all sorts of real estate. But then, in 1870, the hammer started hitting. His only son, of four years old, died of scarlet fever. Just a year later, in 1871, the hammer hit again. While still mourning his son's death, the Chicago, the great Chicago fire that you studied about in school swept the city and Horatio's wealth went down with it as many of his properties burned. Two years later, after rebuilding some of his wealth, Horatio's planned a vacation with his family to sail to London. But at the last minute, he had to stay back for a business meeting, so he sent his wife and four daughters on a boat over to London, and the hammer hit again. Because as his wife and four daughters were crossing the Atlantic in the middle of the night, their boat collided with another boat. And his four girls, along with 226 others, that night drowned. His wife made it to the other side and wrote him and said, would you come as quickly as possible? And Horatio got on a boat and crossed the Atlantic. And as he was crossing exactly where his daughters drowned, the captain showed him where that was. And in that moment, he wrote these words that would become a very famous hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Was it well with his soul because there wasn't pain? Of course not. That hammer was hitting hard and harder and harder. It was well with his soul because he was in the one who promised peace. He could be protected by life's most devastating circumstances because Jesus had already overcome that. In the midst of tremendous pain, he could still say, you know what? As hard as this is, it's well with my soul. He had found that elusive thing that so many of us this year are longing for. Peace. Shalom. And you can find it too. And so will you receive it? Because Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is offering it to you.